Dragon Slayer Media presents Rich Gaspari and John Romano in Fitness, Fame, and Fortune. So, Richie, I thought we'd talk today about a couple of different topics, um, some of which listeners have asked us to talk about and some uh, you know, off the cuff kind of stuff that we, that we, that we usually do, but I'd like to go, go back a little bit. And I was thinking about Joe Weider the other day, I came across a picture of him and me shaking hands. He, he and I shaking hands and it just kind of, I was just thinking about him and a couple of rare interactions I had with him, a couple of phone calls and whatever. And I just, I, he, he was just such a soothing guy to talk to. Um, be, probably because I wasn't doing business <laughs> with him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you, never did, you never did business with him. You never wrote for him. I, I'm surprised you did all this writing for companies. I wonder why you never worked for Joe Weider. Well, the 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 odd thing is, is that now I am sort of surreptitiously because I am right. I do work for Muscle and Fitness Flex now, is, are submitting articles, but you know, it's three companies removed from Joe. So it's, it's it, it, in a way, it satisfies that kind of need I always, or that sort of desire I always had to work for Weeder. And I, technically I'm not working for Weeder now, but I sort of feel kind of like uh, akin to it because, you know, when I first sort of breaking into the, the writing business, I was friends with Chris Aceto and Laura Crevel. And L Chris at the time was writing, for for flex and muscle and fitness and he used to report directly to joe yeah and i thought how cool would that be as a journalist you know my, my go-to guy is joe weeder you know how how incredible that would be and i was kind of relaying this story it's funny you said it to somebody and they just really don't know much about joe weeder you know what kind of guy he was you know, and and like I said, I never did business with him, so I know he was a very cutthroat businessman, and you have more experience with him, yeah. like that, than I did. But for for, and I kind of want to segue the the conversation to to this point. For many of you guys that came out of of body, you know, in, in, into the beginnings of your career, uh, bodybuilding careers. At the behest of Joe, when you guys got to the glass castle there on in, in, in the valley, a, for a lot of guys, that was their first taste of wealth. Yes. Right? And and so did you notice that? What was because you know Joe had all those statues in the inner offices oh, and, and it, you know, his home was even more cool because I, I you know I got the honor of going to his house as well. And, you know, the fir well, first off, you know, I, I was a kid that, you know, wanted to move to California because I wanted to be near Joe Weider. That was the dream when I was this 14, 15 year old kid <laughs> reading the magazines. He used to have these, you know, I don't know if you guys out there, the young generation is not going to know, it, but he had these little things in the back of comic books. Do you want to be Mr. America, Mr. Universe? And he had pictures of like Dave Draper. Right, and, you know Arnold and Lou Ferrigno and and uh, Sergio Oliva with this little article, you know, to get his on the Weeder systems, and you know, anyway. So as a kid, I always wanted, you know, after I started reading magazines, it's like, you know, I had this opportunity to move to California to the Gold's Gym in Reseda, which was right near Woodland Hills, is where Joe Weeder's office was. Right, and when I first moved to California, I was there managing the gym. Of course, I was a nobody. You know, I won the junior nationals, but I was a nobody. But I, I, I wanted to get to see the Weeder headquarters, and I would drive by it to see <laughs> that building. But I never got to go in it until I won the nationals, and then won Mister Universe, and then got you know the first thing was Joe. I don't know if you know this back then. You know, to turn pro was winning Mister Universe. Once you won the world championships. Joe would be there with your hand up. And then Joe said, do you want to go into the Mr. Olympia? It's two weeks away. And, and you know, the story I have with you guys is, you know, that I was Lee uh, Haney's training partner. And I won the, the the Mr. Universe. And I think it was like two or three. It was maybe three weeks later was the Mr. Olympia. So Joe asked me if I wanted to go. I said, no, I'm not going to go in because I'm helping Lee Haney. And that was the first Mr. Olympia that Lee Haney won. I was there, you know, as his training partner. Wow. But it was just cool that I finally talked to Joe Weider. To me, was like a god. You know, that was the guy, the trainer of champions. 
But I really um, got to meet Joe, you know, where I went to his office. And you guys, if you get to know what, when you went into that office, it was such a cool office. Nothing like it. You walk in, there was this stairway. The that granite, that granite and glass stairway it was granite beautiful. Granite glass stairway. And yeah. then you saw these huge paintings. There was one of, uh, there was one of Arnold, but there was one of, um, what was his name? Uh, the writer, Rick Wayne. Rick there was Wayne. One thing of Rick Wayne with his hands clutched like this in this huge painting. And you go up there and it's Lou Ferrigno and you, you go up the stairs. Yeah, yeah. And then you go to like Joe's office and Joe's office had all these antiquities. He was into the, um, into the uh, Midwestern art. So right. he had a lot of like, you know, horses and cowboys and, there were, bronze, there were bronze, bronze statues. Yeah, yeah, bronze statues of this. He was really into Midwestern yeah. art. So he had a lot of that. And then he also had the statues like of Louis Sierre and, you know. The Sandow. Original, he had that big yeah, Sandow the, statue. The original Sandow. The yeah. Sandow that they copied the Olympia trophies off. Of. Right. He had that. And it was just, when you went in there, I, you know, I was a 20-year-old, 21-year-old kid. I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, and then he had all the covers on there that you would see in his office. He had this beautiful desk. Remember that huge desk that he had with all the, I don't know, just antiques. <laughs> yeah, I guess that all. I, it was just, it was so much to, to take in. But, um, you know, Joe really, and, and this is what, you know, people, there, there's some of these haters in bodybuilding that they thought he was a jerk off. I, I never had any bad. Uh, feeling with Joe. Joe saw me as this passionate guy. He also saw me as a guy, you know, he always says, you know, you can give a man a fish, but if you can teach a man to fish, he'll he'll eat for life. And what he saw in me is just like, you know, when he when he asked me, you want some money? And back then there was not these big contracts. There was small contracts. They offered three, four, five thousand dollar contracts that they would offer. He goes, I can give you that contract or I can give you an ad. Wait, wait, three, four, five thousand dollars a month, right? A month, a month, yeah. Okay, good. So he could pay me five thousand dollars a month because I was a top Olympia guy, or you could take uh, two pages, one in flex and one in muscle and fitness. I thought to myself, I could take those two pages and I could start selling my wares, which I did, and I ended up making ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month in what? selling what? My, my magazine, my my pictures, my t shirts. I had this new age clothing line. I had videos. I had booklets that I sold on in, in those two magazines. So you think I think you need to sort of quantify what that page was worth in dollars. Because if you went to buy that page in muscle and fitness, it would be about twelve thousand bucks. It was about twelve thousand dollars. And I think the Flex magazine was like two or three thousand dollars. Right. So three or three or four, I think. Three or four thousand. Yeah. yeah, three or four thousand. And you had 12,000, which later right. on, I know when I was doing Gaspari, that the pages went up to like twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 a page. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> for me, he's like, I could give you these pages for free. And, and I, and I, and I took them and I ran this, you know, mail order business. Cause I know that's what like the, uh, that's what uh, Arnold did and Franco mm -hmm. did. And, you know, so I said, I'm going to do the same thing. I know you, what you did with those ads is you sold them to other companies which I didn't know you could do, <laughs> but I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I, I did want to sell my stuff. And Joe really liked me for that. And, yeah. you know, when you go into his house, he had this really cool, also cool thing where you go up the stairs and he had all these like framed, different framed signatures. I remember him having the signature of the, um, the surrender of the Germans in World War I. Wow. He had that document. Wow. The original document that was signed by the Germans. Where was that? It was up his hallway when you went up to his. He had oh. an office upstairs in his house. Oh, in his house. In his, in his house. house. He had this okay. document. He 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 wow. collected. He collected signatures. He had this other one that I'm like Copernicus. Who the hell's you know Copernicus? You see a Copernicus signature. He has Copernicus signature. Holy Just to goodness. let you guys know who Copernicus is, he discovered that the the planets. W went in elliptical orbits, not a circle, circular right. 
orbit. So he's telling me this is Copernicus's signature. And I'm like, back then I'm like, who the hell is Copernicus? <laughs> <laughs> isn't it isn't it interesting the odd sort of interests that the Weeder brothers had outside oh. of bodybuilding? It's like it's like you wouldn't put the two together. I mean, Ben is into Napoleon. Oh, I can hear yeah. so into Napoleon. Napoleon. He wrote books about Napoleon. He actually wrote a book. Ben Weeder wrote, um, I guess, like a thesis or, or like he wrote about that Napoleon was actually slowly poisoned. Yes, arsenic. Yes, he yes, he, that, he proved it. He actually proved, proved it. it. Yeah, he found it in yep. his, I guess, in his body. I guess they they exhumed the body. They found arsenic yep. that he was slowly because they were so afraid. That he was going to come back because you know when he when he when he was in exile on the island of uh, where was he in the exile Capri he was he was put on an island off of France right I don't know left he was left he was left in an island in exile that's what happened and right. then he tried to make a comeback but then he you know like he got sick and died but they poisoned him <laughs> but uh, you're right they had they were very like into a lot of different things you know like I said Joe was more into like the whole Midwestern, you know, cowboys and Indians. And right. That paintings of that kind of stuff is really, really interesting guy. But here's the thing. He was very passionate about bodybuilding. Here's a guy, you know, they said it was Joe Gay. He was far from gay. He loved <laughs> women. Some of the incidents with me. <laughs> so and, yeah. But he, you know, he, he, he definitely loved bodybuilding and, you know, when you come in here, be really excited to see what you look like, you know, because he was like, he, he was just into bodybuilding. And, and, and uh, one of the greatest honors at the time among bodybuilders is being invited to Joe's office to, to, to pose for him, right? For posing, you know, and I yeah. was like, let me see what you look like, Richie. And then you pose for him. And I'm like, wow, this is Joe Weider looking at me. You know, it's just, it was surreal because you can imagine as a kid looking at, you know, the, the trainer of champions and, and here's the thing. He really did care. Like when I trained for the Olympia back then, we didn't have cell phones. He'd be calling my house. And, you know, back then I live with my parents and my mother, he goes, it's a Joe Weider. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> yeah. But, uh, I, I, I remember passing by one time and in, in there in the parking lot, I saw Tim Belknap. Remember Tim? Oh, yeah. 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 Tim Belknap sitting on his, his fender of his car with the trunk open and he's stuffing tuna fish and, and bananas into his mouth. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, I got to go up and see Joe. I got to be big. <laughs> and he's, yeah. he's ah, in the parking lot. <laughs> but, I mean, that's what, think about that. I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's that kind of like a mystique of going to see Joe. I mean, then back in those days, that was huge. That was how, how many bodybuilders got to say that? Well, you know, Joe invited me up to my office to see what I look like, you know? I mean, Joe invited me up to go see him, but Joe would, you know, would sometimes when I got to California, I had lunch with him, you know, at his house. It was pretty cool. Like you said, wow. you're, you're, you're looking at wealth. You're sitting there and he has this, you know, the people that were serving food, you know, with this like four course meal that he would set up, you know, with his servants that he had, you right. know, preparing food for him. So I was like, wow, I want to be like, you know, I used to think about it. It's like, I want to be Arnold, but I was like, I started thinking about it. I want to be like Joe. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't his demeanor so cool? He, oh my God. He, he was like, so like level, but, but he was like, Serious, intense, and extremely polite. You know, and cultured. You know what I mean. He spoke very well. He he was very calculating. The way he dressed, those suits were beautiful. I, I remember his shoes. I remember he had this pair of black shoes that were like tailor made for him. They must have cost three grand. And you could just see that leather was. You couldn't possibly find better, you know. It, it, it was that level of wealth that you just none of us ever saw before, you know. Uh, I, it's you know, this I'm a you know middle class kid from a Mason, you know, co going to see like this guy, <laughs> and you know, I, I I deeply respected him. You know, he always, like I said, we had great conversation. And you know, if you talk to other bodybuilders like Lee Haney or any of these other bodybuilders, you know. Lee Labrada, Barry DeMay, they would all tell you that Joe was so 
like not only kind but like was sincere in how he you know how he was with you mm -hmm. so i was thought like i had this special relationship with joe that you know was different from everybody else but he was like that with all the bodybuilders you know it, it just that's how he was and he really like looked at us as like his kids you right. know like we were his kids and you know even if some of the bodybuilders did something wrong he was like oh he'll come back you know, <laughs> bodybuilders i don't want to mention names but there's certain ones that he told me to watch out for you gotta watch out for this guy rich he's uh he's <laughs> I'm not gonna say <laughs> because it'll be repeated and the guy's gonna know who I'm talking about. But he um he was really he was really good to me. He um talked to me about business. He saw I had an interest in like business and what he did, and he explained to me, you know, how he almost went bankrupt a couple times, you know, and, and getting the company back. I don't know if you know he had this like uh, he had this uh lawyer that was in charge. I guess they went through some difficulties. And they had this controller that was in there. Do you remember that? V vaguely, vaguely. Um, there was some... I forgot his oh, name. What was that? But that, what, what, isn't that when they changed, like they shuffled the things around with the supplement company name and the titles and so. all that? Um, I can't remember his name now. But he he was kind of like he had to follow protocol with this guy that was in there that was in the office later on because I think I think he was like giving away a lot of money. You know, Joe was very. I think he was generous in a way generous, that, he, yeah. that, he, that how he was. Um, so this other guy, Alan Dalton, Alan Dalton, oh, Alan yeah. Dalton. Dalton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dolphin, Dolphin, Alan, Alan Dolphin. Dolphin, Alan Dolphin. Yeah. Alan Dolphin. That, guy, that guy was really uh, the controller that like right. that Joe couldn't make just his own just decision. He'd have to look at what this guy said he could spend and he had to follow protocol. And he would tell right. me, I hate this and I got to do this, Richie. And by the way, this is how he spoke. If you want yeah. to know, just, just kind of like you do it pretty, you do it pretty well. <laughs> you know but, who uh, does it the best? Who's that? Samir. Yeah, no, Samir does it. <laughs> that was one of the guys that Joe talked to me about. By the way, but you know, <laughs> and um, there was other guys that he talked about, like Robbie Robinson. Uh -huh. Um, he had problems with. Oh, he really had a problem with. Um, what was the name of that guy? He he beat Mike Menser um, in the Mr. Universe. And then he went into the Olympia. And he was the one who did the crucifix. Um, what was that guy's name? Do you remember? Big arms. Really big arms. Mm. He had a Calvin Scalic. Cal Scalic. Cal what that's a name from the past. Yeah. Holy yeah. Wow. Yeah. He had a that's supplement cool. company, right? Cal, Cal Vita Cal something. He had a supplement company. Did he? Yeah, he yeah, a, yeah. A cyclist. But anyways, Vita Cal, I think it was. But if you guys look up Cal Scalic, that guy had one of the greatest upper bodies. He beat Mike Menser in the first try that Mike was trying to win Mr. Universe. Calvin Scalic, Calvin Scalic beat Mike Menser. Went into the Olympia the year that Frank Zane uh, won. Was it 78, 79? Anyways, um, I think it was. No, it wasn't. It wasn't 79 because 79 was the year that Mike Menser came second. It was the year that Robbie Robinson, one of the years was 77 or 78 because Frank, Frank Zane won at three Olympias, 77, 78, 79. Anyways, right. Calvin went in. Calvin Scalic went into the Mr. Olympia place like fifth, said it was fixed. You know, <laughs> he sued Joe Weeder, and his Joe was telling me about the lawsuit from, you know, from the bodybuilder that promised him this. And, you know, he had problems right. with Robbie Robinson because of racism that, you know, which Robbie, is really funny because the bust, the famous bust of Joe Weeder like this is, is Robbie, is Robbie Robinson. Robinson's body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he would always talk about like the different bodybuilders, but he goes, they are my kids. You know, you have good kids, you have bad kids. You know, he, consider, he still loved, he loved them all, you know? And in, 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 a, in a very pure, innocent way, Lee Haney tells a, a great story about being out to dinner with Joe one yes. night. Yeah. And it was right after he trained and, and legs, right? Yep. And and Lee gets up to go to, to, to go to the bathroom or whatever, and he takes two steps away from the table, and he both of his quads cramp up. Yep. 
right? Yep. And and Joe gets up out of his chair and gets on his knees and he starts, you know, in the middle of the restaurant, starts rubbing Lee's Lee's quads, you know, to help him with the with, with, with the cramp, right? You heard that story, yeah. And then he, he right in the middle of the restaurant, he was like, "Damn, this guy's doing this right in front of the restaurant." <laughs> he told me that story too, and it's just that's what I'm telling you. There's so many stories from bodybuilders and how he brought Lee Haney to California, got his wife a job at the office, gave him an apartment to live in. That, By the way, I lived in that apartment, you know, with, uh, with uh, Lee. But Joe paid for all that because he saw the potential in Lee Haney. You know, I, I he never – he always asked me, do you want to live here? And I was like, after I won the Mr. Universe, I said, no, nah, Joe, I'm going to live in – I'm going to live in uh, New Jersey. I feel good in my gym. But you know that – you were there because you actually helped me out. A lot of the shows in 87, 86, I'd go to California the last 12 weeks and I would live in California. He paid my all my expenses at the Marina Pacific Hotel that I had all my food. He gave me money for food. He didn't really give me a car because I just could walk to the, <laughs> I could walk to the <laughs> from there. But I, you know, if I did need a car, he'd get me a ride to go because one of the things he goes, you can be here but I need you for photo shoots. You know, if you can be available for photo shoots and I'll let you know. So for him, he was getting content from me while I was living there and he had one of his top guys. So I did as much as I could to give him content, you know, at that time, because especially you're getting in shape for a show. And he's like, I need you for this cover. I need you for this photo shoot. I need you for this thing on arms. I'd be the first one to never say no to him to do that. Yeah, yeah. The photos, and that's why I think it was one of the most <clears throat> um, photographed bodybuilders of my, you know, of my time because I always made sure I was available before the show if I was living there, and after the show for at least two to three weeks out, I keep myself in contest shape because a lot of guys after a show would just pig out, and he saw that value in me then. But I, I, I have nothing but good things to say about Joe. I don't know if you know this when Joe died. There was only a couple people that got to speak at his memorial and requested by Joe because I don't know what I guess he saw that I was, you know, what I did with my company and all. I was asked to speak at his funeral. That is not his funeral, but his memorial. So here's here's the lineup of people that spoke. There was there was a lot of people that were non-bodybuilders, but the bodybuilders were Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lou Ferrigno, Franco Colombo, Corey Everson, and myself. Wow, that's quite that's that's uh, quite a co company to be in. Jeez. Yeah. So so, and when he when he would when he would that's got to be an incredible lifestyle for a young single bodybuilder to be you know living in at the Marina Pacific Hotel, which is for those of you who don't know, pretty much on the water or on across the across the alley from the beach. Yeah. Okay. And and. Your walking distance to Gold's Gym, World Gym, you know the the, the bodybuilder friendly restaurants in the area. Yep. You're on the beach. It's it's beautiful Southern California weather, and all you have to do is eat, train, and be ready for a photo That's shoot. That's all I did. <laughs> eat, train. That was like the best. I have to say, you know, you guys don't understand like a great life. I was just living the lifestyle, saying wow, how could I have even a better life than this? Like I'm doing what I love to do, you know, training twice a day, you know, training in the morning, going back, taking a nap or going to the beach, laying out, you know, on the beach, you know, it was, it was, it, when you call it the golden era, I was living in the golden era of bodybuilding. And I, and I, and I didn't really realize that till now that, you know, the today's bodybuilders are not living that same era where, you wanted to be in the Mecca. They called it the Mecca for a reason. You had every great bodybuilder training in Gold's Gym and World's Gym. So I wanted to be there to train with the best of the best because, you know, I'm crazy, John. And I had this type of mentality that, you know, I was very competitive. I didn't care who it was, Tom Platts, the, the, the mensur. I didn't care. It's just like, I'm here for a reason and I'm taking over. That's the way my attitude was. Did you ever think it would end? Were you, were you kind of like in this perpetual, I'm going to be doing this forever? Were you, or obviously, intellectually, you didn't. But 
did, did you sort of think, wow, this is just, I'm going to just be, keep doing this? Or did I, you I, like I, ride I it like you stole it? No, I, I, I had that thought that, man, this is never going to end. I'm, I'm living the friggin' life. I'm like, you know, I'm making money, doing exhibitions and seminars, you know. But back then, this is the eight, late 80s, 90s, that I'm making three to $5,000 to go pose on stage or making $2,000 just to talk about how I train and eat, you know, in front of people, you know, and doing like several of those a, a week, you know, when I was doing, you know, my, my tours. And no, I never thought it was going to, I didn't think it was going to end, but I knew it was going to end. I, it was in the back of my mind. This is not lasting forever. And what am I going to do? Because I know this is going to end. I'm going to either, you know, there's always going to be someone that's going to beat me, which eventually happens. And, you know, or I'm going to get injured. So, you know, what did I do? I bought a gym. I don't know if you know that. That's one of the things I had in uh, New Jersey. Um, but no, it's just, you know, when you talk about Joe Weider, what he gave to me was that opportunity to take something that I just so loved since I was 11-year-old kid and turn it into, you know, making money, you know, and making my parents proud and, and traveling the world and getting experience in business you know, using, you know, my mail order business really taught me a lot of things in running my supplement business, you know, and running that business. So he really helped. And, and what Joe liked about me is I was one of those guys that wasn't about just taking because there were so many people that just wanted to take from him. Like, what, what can I take from this guy? And I never wanted anything from him. I just I wanted the exposure. I wanted the you know, getting on covers. But I never sat there and said, Joe, how much money are you going to give me? I never did that. Did, did he used to uh, attend your photo shoots? Did you re did you remember him doing all that? The time, all the time. He would always be there. When I came to do covers, he was always there with the top photographers. This is what I was going to tell you a story about him, like about women. You know, so I, I came with my girlfriend. And, of course, he always had these hot models that we did, you know, do these pictures. So just as a joke, you know, just as a joke, he saw, like, my girlfriend was getting a little jealous. So he's like, Richie grab her ass like you really like her you know so i'm like and that was kind of like doing it because i was uncomfortable because right there is my girlfriend watching no do it like this and he's like and then he i, I see him like snickering this fucker's trying to get me in trouble you know <laughs> but it was like he was like it was really funny you know but he you know he loved the art of bodybuilding and you, you know, you talked earlier about what is bodybuilding? Is it a sport? Is it an art? I consider it an art, an art. It's an art form. Do you have to go through physical training to get to this art form? Yes, you do. It's like you're, you're building a statue by, you know, throwing clay to build up your chest or your shoulders. But what are you doing? You're displaying your body after all this physical, you know, exertion that you're doing to build that body. You know, is it really a sport? It, it, it's something that, you know, is subjective. You really don't sit there and you run through the finish line and pick a winner. So when, when someone, you know, argues with me, it's a sport. I said, it's not a sport. It is an art form. You know, you have to go to the gym to get to look like a certain way to be that art form. But is it really something that you can say, I don't know, I can't really say anything about sports because in the Olympics you got curling, which I think is a ridiculous sport, it's like throwing that thing across the ice. So can bodybuilding be considered a sport? Maybe in that sense, because if curling's a sport, why not bodybuilding? But I mean, what do you think? I, I, I kind of think of it, you know, when, when people tell me I said it's an art form, it's not a sport. Well, I mean, to, to, to label it a sport is, is kind of odd because really what the, audience pays to see is by no means a sport no um it, it it's being it's a performance by athletes but it's not a sport the sport to me in my opinion is the sport is in the gym yeah but not only in the gym it i look at it this way becoming okay any aspiring bodybuilder you always aspire to be the top okay you want to be the best so in this case mr olympia so in order to become Mr. Olympia, 
that, that, that creates a set of problems that need to be solved. And you look at it on a pie chart, and each problem is a slice of the pie. You know, you've got training, you've got diet, you've got therapies, you've drugs, supplements, you know, all, all kinds of stuff that, right, go into making Mr. Olympia or your pursuit of Mr. Olympia. And, and solving those problems is is in my mind the sport that's that's the sport getting to the stage is the sport you actually present what you've created in an artistic way obviously but the result that's the result of whatever you want to label as the sport so um you know that that's kind of how i look at it no i i mean i agree you have the physical you know part of it to go to the gym and train you know, and being that, to, to be that bodybuilder on stage. But what you're doing on stage has nothing to do with the prep. Well, it does in a way because you have to practice posing. But a lot of what you're doing is you're training. The people don't see what takes to make that body. The dieting, you know, the training, you know, the tanning, all the preparation it takes to get ready to go on that stage. You know, that's that's the part that, it's all the stuff that comes together, to, you know, to get you to be that bodybuilder, you know, on stage. So, I mean, I spent hours, you know, posing too, because that it, it's, it's good that lately the art form is coming back because of classic bodybuilding. But for the last couple of years, it, it, it's the last five, six years, it was lost. It was a lost art, you know, back go five, six, eight years ago, bodybuilding posing was completely lost. I thought the routines were shit. The only guy who really posed that gave a good show is someone like a Kai Green that still saw like something in that, even though there was, I guess they didn't score it. And back when I posed or when I competed, they did score the posing round. But here's the thing. If you were better physically, they didn't sit there and give you a higher score. There was guys that did unbelievable routines. Is that guy supposed to come in first? I mean, what I think posing did was if you had two guys that were exactly the same and one guy presented himself better with a posing routine, then that guy could get the nod, you know. I, I love how we segue into these topics because now I got to ask you something. <laughs> well, you were a, you a judge. You, yeah. you, you've you judged Olympias, haven't you? I judged the Olympias a couple times. I judged the Arnolds. I have judged pro shows, yes. Okay, so now as a judge, when when – you you could you could look back at the evolution of of let's just say posing for example when as a judge did you notice holy shit no one's doing a vacuum anymore or, 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 I, or I, no I, one's I, you turning know, their, you know I noticed yeah. that right into like you know it's funny it's like you know I love Branch Warren but I you know I asked Branch Warren which how many years ago is he's going back ten years twelve years. Well, yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah, I would say, hey, I, I think do a more. vacuum. He goes, I can't do a vacuum. I mean, the vacuum was lost probably the early two thousands. I, I I do remember Ronnie Coleman doing vacuums, but correct? not it, or very early on. Early on, as he got bigger, he yeah. couldn't do vacuums. When he started getting to that three hundred mark, he couldn't do vacuums anymore. So the the much bigger bodybuilders. Cannot cannot do back. I, I think you tell me the reason. I just think when you try to get that big and you're eating so much, I don't know. They say it's the insulin. They say it's the GH. What's the reason why the those pros could do vacuums? You know, I, I had a whole bunch of theories at one point, you know, and then I started remembering John Defendus, who – had one of the most spectacular vacuums in the business and he oh, was yeah. like 260, you know? So, um, I, I don't think that, I don't think that argument really stands up. I think that there's a, a, a several elements of classic posing that were lost. You notice the guys don't turn their heads anymore in a back yeah, double yeah, bicep yeah. and a back lat spread. Yeah. Why don't they do that? I mean, it completely identifies the trap in a really cool way. And you know what I don't like is the way the bodybuilders stand on the relaxed pose. It's almost like 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I mean, not relaxed. It used, be, it used to be a natural <laughs> relaxed. You know, mm -hmm. you flare your lats and you would stand. These guys now are like this. Right. It, like, was, it just looks to me. It looks terrible. So, so going back to the judge judging, was there, was there sort of ever like judge judges talking, maybe at a judge's meeting or any kind of thing like that, where you guys would sort of, you know, discuss the topic that wow, no, no do you, anybody else ever notice that no one's doing a vacuum anymore? Are we just not? Are we just going to forget about the vacuum? I mean, uh, it was I mean, it, it was kind of it's almost kind of like now that condition. <clears throat> excuse me, conditioning has become such a point of contention that there is a faction that is willing to forgive striated glutes as not being a, a great indication of condition. It's like I, they're I accepting it. it. Yeah, that, 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 like, I brought that, by the way, guys, I brought that into the sport. <laughs> you know, striated glutes. No one saw a striated glute until I came into the sport. And then from there, bodybuilders had to have striated glutes to be in condition. And is it indication? I mean, there can be other parts of your body that can really look, you know, ripped to shreds um, and still show conditioning. But striated glutes are one of the big factors because when you can really lean out and you look at your glute and the tying into your glute into your into your hamstring and there's no fat and it's just you see your glute, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it is a, you know, I used to say that this is a muscle. Your yes. glute is a muscle. So why wouldn't it be displayed? Right. Um, but did I, you know, talk with judges on things like vacuums? They really didn't discuss that. I mean, they never really discuss. I mean, they discuss things like if you see people with their stomach out, score them lower, you know, you know, because they, they didn't want, it, you know, distended guts, which started coming about. I mean, right. it got bad. It got bad with some of the sport, you know, into the, like the national calibers with these guys that were just trying to get bigger, but they had these huge guts. So when they would pose from the front, they really struggled to keep themselves. They can't do a vacuum, but they, they can try to keep their stomach flat. But then when you see them doing a back double bicep, their gut was like, bam, out. You know, totally out. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, Ferrigno was was famous for that. I mean, you know, he, he Louis could do an, a for, think of the huge guys from them that could do a vacuum. Draper, Arnold, yeah. Louis, um, you know, all, all of these guys that we talked about, you know, Menser, freaky, he he was pretty big at that at, at one point, still sucking up a vacuum and a, a deep um defendus was very a uh, big dude do a vacuum so it, it just seemed to like all of a sudden guys just stopped doing it and i don't know do you it, it it it's it seems to me that that when a when a kind of an aspect of the sport evolves into the what the way they stand not doing certain poses omitting certain critical you know elements of condition things like this sort of and, and it and it's not I don't I don't see it really being tolerated in the other other divisions. It just seems that you know open bodybuilding is kind of like you know the Joe Biden of bodybuilding. No no nobody nobody. What about what about, what about cams? You know? What about cams? Yeah, like, cams are they, starting they, to disappear. Yeah, people don't they don't even judge cams like so they don't even look at it. And I've seen a lot of guys that just have no cams. I mean, these are top pro bodybuilders with no kit. Listen, I, I I love Dennis Wolf, but he had no calves. It was a guy, great physique, right? No calves. And I mean, there were some guys winning shows that didn't have great calves. Listen, I trained with Lee Haney, and that was one of his weak points were calves. We trained calves three times a week. First thing before any of the body parts, heavy, heavy, heavy donkey calf raises. I don't know wow. if you saw. I used to put 150 pounds, or sometimes four 45 pound plates with a dip belt and I have two people on my back, <laughs> and, you know, donkey cap raises. Right. And, you know, so did, you know, so did uh, Lee Haney. We, we busted our ass because that it did matter. Like how your calves looked. I, I I don't see anybody doing donkeys anymore. There's a donkey machine. I think I carry and makes one. Yes. Um, that, that people use it in some gyms, but for the most part, if you don't have a, if you don't have that machine in the gym, nobody does donkeys. A lot of gyms, like I, I, you know, I was training at LA Fitness. The only thing they had for calves were like a seated calf machine. That was it. Yeah. But what happened to the standing calf? 
What happened to the donkey cat? I mean, I'm not going to do donkey calves anymore with people on my back. I actually have posted on my Instagram, you know, me doing old school with two guys on my back. And they're like, <laughs> man, that looks gay with you guys. Yeah, these really fucking homophobes, man. <laughs> but uh, I go, I never they're thought. They're the ones you got to watch out for, you know. Yeah. It's, it's the guys who don't pay attention to it that are fine. It's the ones that got to call the attention to it. They're the ones that might be a little soft. I know. That's what I was like. I, I never thought that about doing that. I, just tried to find <laughs> heavy, I would always try to find the heaviest guy to jump on my <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Uh, it developed my calves. The donkey calves for me were the best exercise. Yeah. Guys, you want to develop your calves? You do them first. You got to keep the reps at 15 to 20. You got to do drop sets. And you got, and you know, because calves are a muscle that you constantly walk on. So you really got to blast them. So I would do five to six sets of donkey calf raises, two guys on my back with, a, with, with you know, 150 <laughs> pounds and 200 pounds and a wow. dip belt. You know, you do, you know, 15, 20, 20, and then stretch, 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 stretch. Right. Stretch, a lot of stretching. In a lot of stretching for, yeah. for building calves. Yep. You want to build calves. But you have to do calves frequently, too, like three times a week to build them, not once a week. And I see guys doing calves like once a week now. Well, it's interesting. Calves, and and I think to a, 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 an equal degree, abs and forearms are kind of like in that same category. Yeah. Well, I, I can't speak for those because I never did forearms because my forearms develop real easy. So I never did forearms and I never did abs. <laughs> and that's well, that. wait, no, yes, but you, your dad used you like a like a tractor when you when you you were you had a cement block in each hand. You had yeah. rebar. You were you were doing plenty of forearm work in in very sure. developmental years. Okay, so you can't say that you never worked forearms. No, but, I, I, you know, <laughs> I out there and do I did wrist curls. You know, I did it once in a while. Like, ah, I need to you ever do the broomstick with the rope and the plate oh, hanging. That from one too. Like, so but you know what it was for me? My weakness was my <laughs> arms to grow. My forms grew easy. My forms are right. still big. It was my biceps that I had to really focus on and take the emphasis off my forearms and put on more into my, you know, my bicep training. So I, I didn't train forearms back then. Well, wow. well, you didn't need to. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's funny about guys working construction who also bodybuild. It's it, it, there comes a point with how much of the work day can you ascribe to, you know, a, a physical count as some physical activity towards your bodybuilding in addition to training. I remember working construction, and some days, you know, you wake up in the morning early. To the the only way you can actually do it is you got to train first. There's no way that you can work construction all day and then go train. I mean, oh I, I didn't know any guys that were able to do that. No way. But so you train and really, and by the time you get to work, man, you're shot. And then you got to you know carry rebar, blocks, hammer nails, do you know swing a sledgehammer. You got to do that shit all day long. You know, it, get, it gets to be. Don't don't you count some of your you know physical strength to the fact that you were a very you know physical worker for the a part of your life? Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, I had to do a lot of work that I hated. <laughs> and, you know, as a mason, the or the ones where um, you pick up those twelve inch semi solid blocks and put them on scaffolds, doing that for your shoulders. Um, yeah, I started turning into a. I remember when I was there working for my dad, I said, okay. You know, we used to do chimneys and chimneys, you'd have to take, you know, you'd have a scaffold and then you have the, you know, the, you have this place to put the cement and you had to like this little wheel and you had to like you host it up. Host it up. It was like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is working my forearms really good. <laughs> and the, in the bucket, how much was that? It was like a can of cement. Not yeah. a can. It was like, a, what did he use? Like, it was like a five gallon. Yeah. That thing like was heavy. Five... What was that? Was that like 30 pounds, 40 pounds? Oh, more than that. It was 50 pounds. 60 or 70. 50, 70 the, the, the round high. It was called the hod, right? It was shaped yeah. like a, had a little bit of an angle to it. Yeah. So I'd have to like. Yeah. On the wheel. The, what's that thing that he puts the cement in? The uh, the a big tr oh, the trough. The trough. The big trough. Thing. Yeah. So he's building, you know, I had to supply him with supplies, you know, up the uh, scaffold doing chimneys and stuff. But uh, yeah, that was the physical work was hard work. But I always told my dad, it's like, this is not building muscle. Now it's funny because they call it functional training. Now. Right. <laughs> You're doing, you know, flipping tires or, 
you know, all these exercise. You can make a whole – my dad could have made a whole gym, you know, this training, you know, system – and get free workers just by saying hey, <laughs> get you in great shape, you know. <laughs> well, we, when we started, when we started a foundation, I mean, there was there was just a crew of us that just did. They rotated us at one point. You know, one part of the day you're carrying a block in each hand, a twelve inch yeah. block, you know, and you're carrying up though up and down the planks, and then they relieve you from that, and then you got to carry rebar, and the rebar you're carrying one hand out here, one hand out here, and every step you take, it's bouncing, right? Yeah, bouncing. Remember that? It's bouncing. Your traps are going up and down, and then you got you, you know, there's the the clip, the thing that. Remember, it was a piece of metal in the hand. It was like a claw, and you could carry like eight bricks at a time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember? <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> yeah, one of those in each hand. Yeah, yeah. And, and then when we did the roof, we had to carry, carry the roofing signals up onto the roof, okay. and you had to carry one on your shoulder. Then you started showing off, and guys were doing it one on each shoulder and carrying it going up the ladder without holding on to the second oh, floor. Yeah. Yeah. So that was <laughs> So who can go to the gym after that? I mean, you're trashed. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. That, I mean, that's what I said. We, we've we done stuff that probably you could have turned into like, you know, here's a great functional training workout for you. <laughs> best shape of your life. <laughs> and now people are paying 500 bucks a month to belong to a CrossFit gym. But no. <laughs> they could have made 500 picture. bucks a month. <laughs> yeah. I'd say that I wish I would have turned that back then into, into a, you know, I said a workout. <laughs> But um, we we got we got way off track, John. Where did we go? <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> we I was just gonna say. <laughs> but this guy, this exactly is what job. John and I do well. You know, when we speak, you know, we, we're this is something how we came up with this show is like, you know, we talk for like an hour on the phone. We should put this into a podcast <laughs> because we're just gonna go off different, you know, things that we're gonna talk about. But you know, we went about Joe Weeder. You know, like I told you, I, I still feel you know and i want people to remember i posted about joe weeder i did an interview with joe weeder you know, a couple years it was maybe about four or five years before he died you know he was already getting old and you know i remember coming to his office and he was almost like embarrassing you know how do i look he was very into how he looked you know he was you know he wanted to really look good um you know i remember he had like hair you know back then uh, he was part of the Bosley hair yeah, club. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he had he had hair transplants put in. Um, <clears throat> he, I, I had lunch with him one time, and he he had these X's in his eyebrows, like stitches in his eyebrows, like these yeah. X shaped scars. Yeah, he must have some eye lift or something. Oh, yeah, had an eye lift, you know, I had an eye which lift. I would do. I've said <laughs> I would. <do> that. <laughs> <laughs> you would do all the stuff that he, that you know when you were a kid, you're looking at now. You're like, I do everything he did. You know, yep. he did. He did. Yep. And, you know, I just remember him in his, like, because when I remember him, you know, I remember Johnny, I think he was already in his mid-60s when I was in my 20s, you know, <clears> and he was still really with it, you know. Yeah. I think, I, think oh, he he was, kinda, I, I don't think he ever lost his 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 marbles. I just think it was his, it's just his health in general. You know, what's funny is he didn't know how old he was. No, <laughs> he, he, there was there was some discrepancy in his birth year, so there's no. He was born. He was born either night because I have somewhere where he said he was born 1919 or 1920. Right. My dad was born 1920, so it was like he's the same age as my dad, but he was just compared to my dad. You know, he had so many things that were like so cool about him. You know, this guy, like you said, it was super successful, money. You know. This, here's one thing about Joe. You know, he lived in a neighborhood. He didn't live in Beverly Hills. No. That's something also. He didn't live in this Rodeo Drive. He lived in an area of Los Angeles that was pretty populated. He didn't have a big driveway. He, he just had a simple, you know, it was like you go in. I mean, the inside of the house was really nice, but it wasn't something from the outside saying, wow, look at that house. You didn't say that. He also never drove anything. He didn't drive a Rolls Royce. He drove a Lexus. He drove, you know, like the, the blue Cadillac. He drove Cadillacs, Lexus, and, and Lincoln or a Lincoln. Was it a Lincoln or a Cadillac? The blue one, the dark blue one. It could have been a Lincoln. I, I mean, I remember he, he was driving Lincolns, and toward the end, he was driving Lexus. Lexus. He never drove Mercedes. No, um, I didn't see him driving anything. Like, wow, look at that car he's driving. It was it was a nice car, but it was just. He, he, he didn't want to show off in that. He wanted to be with the common people. He, he wanted to be there with people. He wasn't that way. 
you know. He, he, he was very, he was humble. It was, it was an interesting mixture of being humble and, and, and being, he, he practiced, he was affluent. He was, he was affluent, but you ever hear the different, you ever hear the expression old money? Yeah. You know, call or cultured money versus nouveau riche or new money. He, even though he was kind of like new money, cause his parents weren't wealthy by any means. <laughs> Um, so he 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 created the Weeder family wealth, um, and and shared it with his brother really, and I, I, um, so I I don't know really where he got that, but he was very elegant. Would you yeah. say that? Would that that's a good? I, I, would, I would say yeah, very polished and very, you know, like you said, he just had that class. Like when you went to dinner with him, how he would be in a restaurant, you know. Like I told you, I ate at his house and he'd have these servants come and the way he had, the, you know, his meals, it, it was just, you know. And But he but he wasn't, it was just kind of like normal for him though, yes, right? I mean, yes. Right? It, it wasn't, there was no air about it. It was no, just, no. this is how I live, you know. This is how I live. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I, live. <laughs> I remember when he sold the company and, he, you know, he sold it for $330 million or something like that. Yeah. So. I remember visiting him, you know, I went to his house and he goes, I loved Weeder. I love the company, but Richie, $330 million. <laughs> I had to take it. I had to take it. He's going to be, <laughs> you know, you know, later on he sold the part of the companies. He had these other ones, Schiff, Do you know, uh -huh. Schiff? Uh, they, he kept Schiff, and later on the, Ben Weeder's son sold that for a billion dollars. Yeah, and the and the building the was Betty's the 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 Weeder that that, that, that was not that. wasn't that a giant office building that held, there were other tenants in there weren't there or it wasn't all just him or was it I don't remember I, I think it was all I, for my what I remember it was all him it was it was, it was just, yeah you're right it was it was, it was two two floors or three with Weeder remember the yeah. big sign. On the outside it, was a big, it was a big glass facade. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful, beautiful. building. Beautiful yeah. Building. Did Joe ever talk to you about business? Like Richie, sit down. I we got to. You know, let me, let me teach you something. Was it? Was he like that? Or like he told me stories about things that he's done. You know, like he said he had this big lawsuit. Um, he had a big lawsuit. I guess it was from the. Um, was it the government suing him? Like the um, the FTC was suing him because he was showing products, right, with these, you know, whoever bodybuilders that they were displaying. And it was basically false advertising because if you use this product, you're going to look like Dave Draper or Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he fought this on his own, he said, where was, he was comparing, you know, toothpaste commercials and he was looking at where, you know, people were brushing their teeth and they, people had white teeth. And is it proving that that toothpaste caused their teeth to, you know, to have these perfect teeth, this toothpaste? You know, so he actually, he beat the FTC um, on, on this whole thing with, you know, using products and athletes displaying them because he goes, well, it, you know, why is toothpaste getting away with it? You know, and he fought this thing. And with, he said, I didn't even use a lawyer. I did this myself. You know, he was telling me how in court he did this, <laughs> you know, and, and um, he told me like a lot of stories about business. And, you know, when I, when I started Gasparri Nutrition, I was doing really, really well. And I went to see him and I said, Joe, I want to tell you what, what I'm doing. And he goes, I know exactly what you're doing. And I'm very proud of you. You know, I'm very proud of how you, you know, built your own company. And that shows me that you were able to, you know, you, 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 like he said, you knew bodybuilding didn't last forever. You guys, you can't be a champion forever. You have to figure out how you're going to take that and, and put it into something else, you know, and I put it into my brand and he saw that and he was actually very proud of me for doing that, you know, and he offered me discounted ads. I remember going to see him and then he already sold the company and he's trying to give me discounted ads and like, Someone was telling me in the office matters. He says he can't offer you any deals. He doesn't own the company anymore. <laughs> he just, he's just here. He just, he <laughs> let him in. you know, it was almost like they had that office. I don't know if you know this, like David Pecker took over and they kept that office for, I don't know how many years 
afterwards, but they kept that weeder office. But really, they were running everything from New York. You knew that. Yeah, well, they were running everything from New York, but Betty owned the building, so I guess that that was. I guess there was some kind of contingency in the in, in, in the in the sale of all that. I don't know. I you know people. We none of us really know the the intricacies of that machination. But what was kind of interesting, speaking of his lawsuits, is when I start first got my Twin Lab uh, contract. I think when I guess it was ninety two, maybe. Um, Twin Lab was suing Weeder because Twin Lab would pay to sponsor the bodybuilding shows, and they would Weeder would take down the Twin Lab um, logo on the on the uh, on the backdrop. You know, because remember back then they used to have the all the sponsors had their logos on the backdrop behind the. You know, so they get the photo when, when they took the photo of the bodybuilder in the magazine, the logo of the company would be in the photo, and that was kind of like your that was. That was kind of like <laughs> adver digital advertising back when there was no digital. Yeah, okay, yeah. so so um so to, so the they were citing unfair business practices or 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 um or or tortious business interference by the fact that they would r remove the logo and they were paying for the exposure, right? So Twin Lab tried to prove that that was hurting their business, and then Joe turned around and proved that in the in court that their sales went up. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> yeah. So the judge threw the case out. <laughs> so Joe, was Joe at the was in the case was there? I don't I don't know if Joe was there. I don't think Joe was there, but his lawyer, his lawyer, the argument what was argument against Twin Lab was where are the damages? Your sales went up. How did how did that damage you? So by virtue of their sales going up, the, the judge ruled in favor of Weeder and said, You're you're off the hook. Wow. <laughs> So that's, I mean, like, like I said, he was a very smart, savvy businessman. You know, you could call him ruthless, but he protected his company. You know, I, I saw a lot of the wars he had with Dan Laurie and, and Hoffman. You know, he fought those. Those were two big adversaries for him. Dan Laurie was a big adversary to him, you know, when they had the two different organizations. And eventually you saw Joe won, you know, with his organization, the IFBB, and, you know, then... You know, Jim Mannion supplying them the feeder athletes with the NPC. He, you know, he, I mean, he made all this, right? I mean, he caused. Well, 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 well the, the, the story goes at, from Joe's own mouth is is that, well, there was Bob Hoffman had the AAU. Yep. Right. And and bodybuilding was an event that was held. There was no IFB. This is before the this is how the IFBB came to be there. There was the AAU was putting on powerlifting shows and and bodybuilding they'd put a couple tables together and the bodybuilders would stand on the table and they'd have at the end of the powerlifting show they'd have a bodybuilding contest yeah so they were some kind of some kind of dispute erupted backstage when when Ben and Joe were there with the AAU bodybuilders and they said some kind of I forgot exactly what it was that the AAU wasn't going to allow them to compete unless they did something or whatever. And then Ben and Joe decided right there, that's enough. We've had enough of this. We're just going to form our own organization and tell everybody to come with us. And that's basically how the IFBB was born backstage at an, a, at an AAU. And what, about, and what about Dan Lurie's? I remember Dan Lurie was, was uh, the WBBG, the world bodybuilding guild. Do you remember guild. that? Guild. They used to use that word back then. Guild. Yeah. Guild. So the World Bodybuilding Guild. The bodybuilders that came out of there were. Remember Don Ross. He was a WBBG champion, and the bodybuilder that I first bodybuilder I ever saw. I don't know if you know this. When I was uh, 13 years old, was and maybe I don't know if you heard of him. He came out of Jersey. Was a guy named Joe Spooner. Joe Spooner was a black uh, bodybuilder had a physique very similar to uh, Serge Nubray, really small waist, wide back, big arms. Um, he was this, you know, Caribbean guy and he was training in this gym that I went to in Highland Park, New Jersey. And I, it's the first time I saw this, this huge guy to me. And I was like, holy crap, there's people that can look like his arms were just, to me, were just monster. You know what I mean? His big biceps and this guy, he brought, he was friends with Serge Nubray. One year he brought Serge Nubray 
to the gym in New Jersey. You know, it's a little gym in Highland Park, New Jersey, where I was from. And that was another thing that got me hooked. I said, I want to look like Joe Spooner. You know, it's just the way this guy looked. There's, there was always that kind of standout moment, that guy that you see then – this is it. I'm hooked. I'm bit. The you told, me bit was, you told me it was Lou Frigno. You saw Lou Frigno as a kid. I, th that was, he was the first bodybuilder that I ever saw in person in real life. And he he was he used to train at RJ's Athletic Club, which was a dungeon gym in in Brooklyn, um, in in the basement. You had to climb up the stairs, you know, to get out. At brown paneling, it was dark. I don't know how the hell he trained in there, but. <laughs> <laughs> we were going on my, my it was a Saturday and my dad was going to meet his lawyer for at his office for something, which was an odd thing because he never worked on a Saturday. But we were we parked and we were walking to my dad's lawyer's office and was right past RJ's athletic club and Lou Ferrigno climbed up out of the stairs. I was probably I was probably 11, 11 or 12, maybe, maybe 10, 10, 11 and Louie's probably 18 or 19, you know, at that point. So even though he wasn't obviously as big as he ultimately became, he, and I still remember the green, the green kind of satiny um, onion shorts, you know, the running shorts with the yeah. socks pulled up, you know, halfway up his calves, all the way up his calves yeah, and a yeah. tank top, you know. And, and he was just, to me, just – giant he was tall too you know yeah, but big dude you know for for a kid i mean that and that was it i got i gotta look like this you know that's what, that's what i said when i saw this joe spooner <laughs> i was like wow i go guys can really i mean i got to see people in magazines but that was the first physical person i saw right right and i mean i even serge Nubray, which was was one of the greats i got to see him that he brought him to the gym and i just they they just those guys had well. Sergio Bray had a beautiful body, just like this. Really, right. did you ever meet him, Sergio Bray? Once, yes, I did. I mean, I know he trained in Venice Gold, but yeah, I met him at World Gym actually. So when I saw him, you know, I was this twelve-year-old kid, twelve, thirteen. I was like in awe. <laughs> this guy, I'll hey, bet. Keith, how are you? You know, he had a French accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sergio Bray, <laughs> and uh, the other guy had a Caribbean accent. Um, but Rick if you look Williams. him up, you'll see this guy, Joe Spooner. He's actually pretty up in that um wbbg he went against he he couldn't beat don ross though don ross, remember which don is kind of odd because don don early on had a pretty cool physique he was pretty big yeah but man he got beat up towards the end he tore all he tore his bicep he tore his he, he had all he had but he had all kinds of contraptions for training did you did you know know that about don no i i met him i mean like i said i didn't really know him so later on, when he became a writer for, because he would, you know, he wrote for Muscle and Fitness. Um, yeah, 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 yes, he so did. I'd, I'd have to do interviews with him. He was just a really strange. Well, he, he was a wrestler. He was Don the Ripper Ross, and he used oh, to be Don on the Wally Ripper George. Ross. Remember yeah, the Wally like, George show? He'd go on the Wally George show, and he'd be like a total, you know, Wally George was a staunch conservative, and Don was a liberal, and, you know. Yeah. But uh, but Don used to talk with his hands a lot. He used to do this thing like he was very intense. And he would and this and, and, and that. And one day I'm walking to the gym to Gold's, and he's walking across the parking lot with a, a plank of wood about about three feet long. And yeah. he's got he's got this cable contraption with springs and and gears and mounted to it, and this <laughs> cable with, with a and, and I go, what is that? He goes. This will build your neck like nothing else in the world. And you and he, and he and he puts the plank down on the driveway in the middle where the cars are going <laughs> around us. And he stands on this plank and puts this harness on his head and clips it to this cable. And he's put his hands on his knees and he's going like like this. And every time he goes up the cable is winding these springs up, you know, and is creating increasing tension as it's going up. <laughs> And he was so passionate about it. He's like this, yeah. like this, man. You would, you would die if you saw that. I mean, he, but, he, he was. <laughs> I just remember him as being a character. He's just a character. The way he would, like you said, the way he would, the way he would talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was like 
beet red, right? <laughs> Dan Duchenne, he was the color of raw liver. Yeah, yeah, I was like, <laughs> why was he beet red? I was like, this guy's like beet red. <laughs> oh, hey, man. Richie. You know, you had this like, <laughs> there were just some real, you know, Venice uh, Golds had some characters. Yep. You know, you uh, never forget, you know, some of these guys, you know, just, you know. It was, it was, it was, it was, and everybody, if, if Gold's Gym, not World Gym, World Gym was too serious. That was like a library because yeah. Joe ruled Gold's Gym. Joe Gold ruled Joe, Gold's Gym with an, a World Gym with an iron fist. Yeah. And, and you know, we'll talk about him on the next show because he, he was yeah. another <laughs> character that you had to learn about. And Eddie yeah. Giuliani and that whole, that whole crew. But, yeah. And Arnold, how he fit in. But, but <clears throat> he, he, you know, those, 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 that era in Golds was so saturated with interesting people, you know, from all over the world, from all over the world. And you had girls training in shredded fishnets with, you know, with, no, with body parts hanging out and it guys. Was from a, it was such a show. <laughs> guys like Lyle Alzado. And well, you knew Lyle Alzado. He was nuts. The Barbarian Brothers. Like, guys, if you went to this gym, Back then, it was a circus. Yeah, it was a circus. You really couldn't train in that. Like, I would train, like I said, train in the valley. I would go to World's Gym with Lee, and Lee would never want to go to Gold. Ah, you don't want to go to Gold. He goes <laughs> crazy. It's what? like you're in a, you're in a fishbowl. He goes, you're in a fishbowl. You don't want to go in a fishbowl when you're training. But, but in the midst of all of that, you'd have a photographer setting up for, for, for a photo shoot. And then yeah. Joe, Joe um, Weeder would pull up in his, in, in his end car and he would descend into this realm of chaos in a, you know, in a, in a thousand dollar Brioni suit, you know, and, and he was at home. He was so happy to be in the gym, you know. Yep. And, and remember, he put the oil on the guy, and he'd like he'd yeah. swipe his fingers across his abs like this to just to make sure the oil was going in the right direction. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. He, that was, you know, you, you, if that is what's missing today, exactly. it, it yeah, really is that level totally, of passion. You know, it's totally gone. It's totally disconnected. You know, I mean, there's some there's great bodybuilders. I can't take away the great right. bodybuilders today, but that that camaraderie and connection that was there, you know, and, and it's cool that I got to live in that, you know, yeah. a lot of guys did it. And I, I got to be there and, you know, train there a couple of years living in California, being part of the whole, you know, uh, era, culture. You know, that, yeah. that culture that I, I got to be a part of, you know, driving from the valley to go to, you know, to uh, you know, to go to Gold's Gym or World's Gym was just like such a great experience that I had, you know, I loved going there. And you know, what's funny is I really broke, uh, I almost like wanted to cry because the last year I was here, it was like last year. And then I saw bums in the streets, um, you know, parking lots with just like these cars with people living in them. You know, the, the gym itself, when you go up to Gold's Gym along the sidewalk was just tents, you know, all these tents with homeless people living along the along the tents and you know just smelling a urine it was like like oh my god this was like my i love being there and i was like what the hell happened to my you know my paradise <laughs> i i was i was out there about a year and a half ago to do a, a to get filmed for something and um the the gym it, well, you're right they had the half the equipment was outside under a tent getting rusty yeah. and yep. and the the whole inside was like gutted and 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 the, and your both streets up and down Hampton and Sun and Sunset were just lined with tents and that stench it was horrible yeah. and you're right I mean how what happened? You know, it was I, Ed Connors tells me this story about how after the sale of Gold's Gym, and and the, how the Dollar General guys turned it into you know what they turned it into. How we went inside, and took a look around, and came outside and vomited. You know, imagine how if he went there now or then. You know, I don't know if it's cleaned up any any since, but to see that, to see Gold's Gym deteriorate. From what it was, that whole cry, thunderdome of in, of incredible bodybuilding culture and history go down into you know so, into ruin. I just talking about books. Um, 
You guys want a good read? This was written by uh, my good friend, Ed Connors. So this is the book, The Three Muscle Tears, which has to, the, it's the story of Gold's Gym. I don't know if you, you read this book, John? Yeah, yes. To, uh, Ed sent me a copy. It was just, yeah, just like so that. You, you guys want a cool <laughs> book? You know, he, I, I have all these you know, people, they, they sign the, the books, you know, that they have. And it's like, to me, you know, Ed Connors was a big integral part of my bodybuilding career because he brought me out to California. If it wasn't for Ed Connors, I, I don't know if I would have went out to California. I went into the Junior Nationals and I won that. And then I went into the San Jose Nationals as a heavyweight. I think I've told this story before. I came in fifth place against a really good lineup of bodybuilders. Um, but still getting fifth, you know, against some of the greats. And Ed Connors came up to me, he goes, I own the Gold's Gym, and I'd really like to offer you a job in, in a gym that I'm opening up in the Valley. Would you be interested? And I was just, you know, I was a pre-med student in college, and I was like, fuck it, I'm moving to California. <laughs> yeah, your See, parents were happy about that one, right? Yeah, yeah, my parents were really upset. But um, all in all, um, it was a... Uh, if it wasn't for, you know, I always tell that Ed, you know, if it wasn't for Ed, I, you know, who knows what I've stayed, went to Mount well, California and, you know. He, he, he's, he's subject for another show as well. We'll have him back on this show. We should have him back on. We never had Ed Connors on our show. We haven't? I no, we, haven't had, we should have Ed Connors on our show. I have, because, I've had him on the other podcasts I do. Yeah, we'll definitely, he, he'd do it in a minute. He'd love to do yeah, it. Yeah, we should get him on the show because. All right, you know, I'll, I'll reach out to him. And like I said, he, he's, the, he's a great guy. Um true gentleman you know but one of the one of the pillars of our of our industry but richie honestly though we got to rewind this up we've been okay. yakking for over an hour and we could go we're doing an hour and this <laughs> this is what we do guys we talk <laughs> and we talk about things like we just did because we're gonna john what are we gonna talk about well we'll find something <laughs> and then i go on a rant and that's why the show keeps going on and if you like right. this show remember to subscribe give us your comments like the show and tell us who you want to be on the show or what subjects you wanted to talk about because we're willing to talk about any subject that you guys want to hear because yep. you know john and i really enjoy this you see we have a good chemistry here because him and i like go back i hate to say it like 40 years but that's the way it is <laughs> yeah and and hopefully next week <clears throat> we can time the show so that we're not doing it when my cleaning ladies are vacuuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can hear the or, vacuum in the background, but that's <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. But you know, I, at, how many hours are there in a week? And 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 people who say Murphy's Law doesn't exist are full of shit because <laughs> I can I can list a hundred things that prove it's it, it's true, and this is one of them. The, the hour that we have to do this show is when they show up with the backpack vacuum cleaners on. So. <laughs> I don't need, and I only have two rugs. I mean, I don't know what the hell they're back to. Anyways, right. anyway, guys, like, subscribe, we, and uh, tell us who you want on the show, and we'll see you next week. See you next week.